Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading for today is from Psalm 19. So if you have your Bibles and or a Google app close by, you can follow along with me as I read Psalm 19. Starting in verse 1, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, Sweeter also than honey and drippings off the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is a great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Would you pray with me? Father, as we are spending time in this season trying to wrap our minds around knowing you, uh, Father, as we consider that you are the God who speaks, would this be encouraging to us? Uh, Would this also be appropriately fearful for us. Whatever emotions that we need to have from our passage today, Lord, would you be swift in bringing those before us? And Lord, at the end of the day, would we think more highly of Jesus than we ever have before? Would your grace and your encouragement flow through us and around us that we might serve and worship you as you've created us to do and serve other people as you yourself are doing? Father, we love you. We are thankful for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been journeying together, this is the fourth week, on this series in Knowing God. And so we stopped in our first destination and we said, hey, is knowing God even possible? Is that something that we can even try doing or try knowing? And we, we, definitively, the Bible said, yes, knowing God is something that is absolutely possible. And we know him by the way that he's interacted with us in his word and also the way that he pursues us. And then we went from there and we said, well, if, if God is knowable, then how is he most frequently known in the, in the scriptures? And we learned that he's most known as the king of the universe, as this great king who is worthy of our worship and also invites us to participate in giving him our worship. And last week we said, well, why should we worship him? And one of the reasons, not all of them, but one that we focused on last week is that he is all wise. And that while a lot of times in our lives we have no idea what's going on, we can't make heads or tails about what's going on, but God has never put, put, put off. He always is in control. He always is governing everything that occurs to us based on his wisdom and care for us. But both of those, or all three of those things, really have one big fat assumption. And that big fat assumption is really this, that those things about God are actually knowable, or that he's actually said those things in a way in which we can understand So on our first stop in our carry van, in our minivan, as we're booking it through this journey together on this rough terrain, is to really ask the question, is God's voice knowable? Like, can we really hear from God? Is that really something possible, or is that something that Christians kind of just make up and talk about because it makes us feel better? I mean, let's really ask, let's be honest about the question. Is Is knowing God's voice possible? Because if he has revealed things in the past, and he is a speaking God, then it would, it would make sense that we could know his voice, that we could hear him. And I understand, you know, it's, it's the 21st century, 
And even as I say that, I can feel so much, I want to call it war, warranted pushback. It's the 21st century. Do we really need to think about a God who's speaking and relying upon that? And I want to say beyond the shadow of a doubt, absolutely yes. Because if it's true, it doesn't matter if it's the first century or the 21st century, it's true. And therefore, we need to consider what that means for us in our lives. Can God speak? Does he speak? And most specifically for our purposes today, based on this psalm in particular, is where does God speak? If he does speak is one thing. If I'm going to understand how he's speaking is another thing. And so what I think the psalm does really well is it pulls out, it shows us that there are specific places where we, as people, can hear the voice of God, which is a really big deal. It's a really, really big deal. You know, I have read so many different uh, books, and, and um, uh, this, is not, this is not an honest brag. This is just, I've read so many books about how Christians need to interact with non-Christians in the 21st century, right? It's one of my obsessions. Because a lot of my friends are non-Christians, and I want to know how to communicate with them in a way in which they can, they can intelligibly make sense of my faith. And I know a lot of you guys feel the same way, and so I have tried to scour as many books as I can. And there's one thing that you're not supposed to do around non-Christians uh, in general if you're a Christian, and that's, that's really, you can summarize it like this. You're just not supposed to be weird. Don't be weird. Like, don't be, don't be speaking Christianese or, you know, these weird words. or Just don't be weird. You know, just be normal. Be yourself. But I've attended so many, in the past several years, I've attended so many different groups that I love so much, discussion groups, Bible study groups, where there's a mixture of people all over the faith spectrum, some with zero faith, some with a lot of faith, some with way too much faith, you know, whatever. They're, they're just all over the spectrum, and those are my favorite groups in the world to be in. And I was at this one group in particular where there were several guys that I really, really, really was praying for, loving and serving, and I was trying to show them how just intelligible the Christian faith was. And I remember another friend of mine was sitting across from me, and with the best intention possible, and he's a very mature Christian, and I, I love him to death, and I remember him saying, hey, would you pray for me about, and then he just started opening up. And I thought, oh wait, I've read so many books about this. You are being weird. You just crossed the threshold. We are going to lose these guys. We're gonna, they're going to think we're weird. They're going to write the whole thing off. They're not going to come back. And as he begins to share, I remember just emotionally just shutting down, like, please stop doing this. Please stop. But what I noticed began to occur is that the people who weren't professing to be believers. We're probably some of, the, some, of the mo- some of the most honest people about their own skepticism with God. I saw their guards begin to drop. And then the miraculous occurred. They began asking the group, hey, would you mind, you know, praying for me about my marriage, about my kids? I don't know where my job is taking me. I feel so perfect. Like, it just, people started sharing. It wasn't weird. Now listen, you're not going to read any books on how to interact with, you know, people that believe differently than you than, than, that are going to come out and say, hey, you need to start, you know, sharing your prayer requests with people, and then that way you'll connect. There's, there's, it's not out there. But there's something to it. And I think this is what occurred. In my experience, and maybe you've experienced this as well, this is what, this is what I learned in that moment, in that particular setting, that all of us, when times are topsy-turvy, when times are indifferent, when times are hard to wrap our mind around what's going on, there's something inside of us. It's almost as if we're wired this way. There's something inside of us that desperately wants to hear a divine voice. Someone objective, someone powerful, someone who's able to tell us this is how things are and this is why it's going to be okay. We all have this this deep capacity for and desire to be a part of experiencing the voice, hearing the voice of the divine. And here's what's so amazing about the Christian worldview, is that the Bible offers us access to that voice, to that person who is powerful in all of our situations and deeply cares for us in all of the situations. So I'm going to pray one more time. I'm going to ask God to, to be with us, and then we're going to jump right in. 
as we really wrestle with this question. If the voice is there, where is it? Where do we find it? Father, be our teacher today. You are our only teacher. Encourage us when you need to be encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God's voice, number one, the first thing we learn from this psalm is that his voice is playing throughout all of creation. Creation, as it were, is like a playlist, right? It's like an iPod, or that's the old term. It's like your phone with an iPod app, and it's just repeating over and over and over. And what is it repeating? In verse 1, it tells us, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, and the sky above proclaim his handiwork. Over and over and over, perpetually, since the beginning of time till the end of time, creation itself is on a looped playlist, telling and echoing throughout all creation how wonderful this God is echoing that you are not alone, I am not alone, there is a God who is worthy of worship, that he exists, that he cares, that he's powerful, that he's majestic, and creation over and over and over is perpetually saying this. It's as if David is looking up, the writer of this psalm, he's looking up in the starry sky, or he's looking out somewhere in the sky, and he's just realizing all of these things have a singular purpose. From the ant to the grasshopper to the moon, to the aliens that live on Saturn. All of these creatures have been made specifically to declare on loop how glorious and how mighty God himself is. So in a a real sense, we could say it like this, that creation is the most relentless preacher that has ever existed in our time. David begins to move from creation in general in verse 3 and 3 through 5, and he begins to talk about one element of creation in particular, the sun. And the sun is doing really two things. Day by day, night by night, creation is on this loop preaching how great God is, telling us we're not alone, telling us how worthy he is. And then the sun, which was the most vital element of creation on the one hand, on the second hand, it's typically the element of creation that receives the most worship in and of itself from Israel's neighboring counterparts. David focuses in on the sun. Why? Because he's going to redefine the purpose of the sun. The purpose of the sun is not for itself to be worshipped, just like any other element of creation. Creation itself is not meant to be worshipped. Creation is a big fat billboard pointing to whom we should be worshipping, to God himself. And I love what he says about the sun. He uses two different descriptors that are so incredibly provocative. I have said that word in a while. So incredibly provocative. The first way he describes the sun is a bridegroom. There were certain portions of the Bible that my mom wouldn't let me read when I was growing up, right? I'll show my cards. It's okay. Like, for one, I never knew that David got his, like, for a long time, we would argue with people. People would say, oh, that was so cool when David Goliath's head. I'm like, that didn't happen. He just, you know, put him to the side or whatever. My mom never read me that part. I was angry. There's other parts of the Bible, and I was not allowed to read. My mom used to say, look, you can read this one day, but this is rated R. You can't do this. So this, look, David right here, I got your attention now. You're so, so excited. The first way in which David describes the son is a bridegroom, what? Leaving his chamber. Now, keeping this PG as possible, the bridegroom, who has just entered into, if you will, a, a very intimate relationship with his now spouse, is now leaving the room, beaming with joy and excitement. Why? Well, you know why. But incredibly, incredibly, incredibly intimate, incredibly motivated, incredibly just experiencing all of the bliss that there is in that intimate union. David is saying the sun has the same enthusiasm, the S-U-N has the same enthusiasm for proclaiming to the world how great and wonderful its maker is. And in the same way, the second way, what is, he says the sun is like a bridegroom. It's a sun, the sun is also like a strong man. The strong man like an athlete who is doing what he loves to do, what she loves to do with all of her heart, with all of his soul, with all of their mind, competing and pushing towards a goal and receiving all of the joy that there is. He's saying that all of creation, the sun especially, in particular, is receiving an immense amount of pleasure, an immense amount of joy from day to day, night to night, in every place in the world, bringing glory and honor to God himself. This continual loop over and over and over again, reminding us that we're not alone and reminding us to look above creation, outside of creation, to the one who made it all. 
John Phillips, a commentator, writes this, this story of this missionary who was in this, what he calls, not great part of the world. And this missionary is working with this tribe, and he's trying to convince him of God's nature and trying to get him to, to think of the God of the Bible as something worthy of, of, of believing in, of, of submitting to. And the, tr- the chief keeps telling him over and over, look, here's my God right here. And he points to a bunch of his idols in his hut. He said, here's my God. Point to your God. And the missionary said, well, I can't point to him. He said, well, you need to show me your God, the chief said, or I can't, I'm not going to believe in your God, neither will any of my people. So finally, the missionary says, I cannot point you to my God, because if you lay your eyes on my God, your eyes will be no more. You will be blinded. He said, but I can show you one of the great messengers of my God. And the chief said, fine, that will do. So he blindfolded him in the hut. He takes him outside the hut. And he's, when they go out into the field, it's midday, and he says, I'm going to remove your blindfold, and I want you to look up. He removes his blindfold, and the chief looks up. And the midday sun is so bright in the chief's eyes that he falls back. And he says, this is the messenger of my God. This is one of the smallest messengers of my God. This is why you can't see my God. You see, the chief didn't understand his language that the, that the missionary was trying to articulate to him in his arguments for the nature of God, but he understood the language that the son was speaking. He understood that there was something beyond that. A lot of times we want to put God in a scientific box. I am very pro-science. Very bad at science, but I'm very pro-science, so please don't hear that. A lot of times we want to say as modern people, if God is real, then he will appear to me in this way. And we have one way that we hold like this. And we say, okay, God, show me you're real by jumping through here. And here's the problem with that. God has revealed himself in millions and millions of different ways. But yet, because we don't get this one particular way, or we don't think we get this one particular way, we're willing to throw the whole thing out. Where I'm going to encourage you is to maybe not think like that. Maybe have a bit more of an open perspective. Maybe there are different ways of testing and proving things other than that one particular way that you feel like you need it proved and tested. For instance, in 1961, when the the Russians uh, went to outer space in one of their excursions, one of the famous Russians comes back and says, listen, I've been to space, and I can definitively prove there is no God. And so the New York Times called up one of the, the best people you can call up in this situation and said, C.S. Lewis, can you please respond to this Russian astronaut's claims that he could not find God in space? Can you please respond to what he says? And in 1963, Lewis publishes this. He says, looking for God or heaven by exploring space is like reading all of Shakespeare's plays in hopes that you will find Shakespeare as one of the characters. Hold on, stay there for a second. Because we're probably not all super into Shakespeare, right? So just hang on. Let that sink. Looking for God or heaven by exploring space is like reading or seeing all Shakespeare's plays in hopes that you will find Shakespeare as one of the characters or Stratford as, as one of the places. Shakespeare is in one sense present at every moment in every play, but he's never present in the same way as Lady Macbeth, nor is he diffused through the play like a gas. Watch this. To some, God is discoverable everywhere. To others, nowhere. Those who do not find him on earth are unlikely to find him in space. Then he concludes like this. Ready? But send up a saint, a Christian. Send up a saint in a spaceship, and he'll find God in space as he found God on earth. And then he says this little phrase, much depends on the seeing eye. Now, what does he mean by that? Because C.S. Lewis is not the first person to talk like this. In fact, he's borrowing from, from an argument that the Apostle Paul makes. How is it possible that, let's just use scientists for, for instance, how is it possible to have two brilliant scientists, one possibly a religious Christian, one person not, they're looking at the same evidence and form completely different conclusions. How is that possible? Same intellect, same data to observe, yet two radically different conclusions. Paul the Apostle offers a solution as to why that is. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says this, which in one sense 
is, helps, helps us understand better this enigma. In other sense, it's terrifying. So I want you to listen to what, what the Apostle Paul says in Romans verse 1. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness, ready, suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has showed it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Now, during quarantine, I think my family and I swam probably more than we ever have in our life. It was amazing, right? I didn't even like swimming until quarantine, really. It was amazing. And listen, my mom's pool uh, in, her, in her backyard is, is nice, but my favorite part is she has these massive beach balls, right? And I love having my favorite, you know, adult beverage, you know, whatever, some kind of snacky food, on a little tray, or just holding it, and they got the big beach ball, right, and they're just sitting on the beach ball, and I like the beach ball for two reasons. One, it's a challenge, right, and two, no one else is fighting over it, so you just get to, you just get to use it the whole time, but here's what's really hard about a beach ball, right? Number one, it's hard to push under the water, number one, right, because it's full of air. It's, I don't know the science, whatever. It just, it's, hard to, it's hard to push down, but then once you get down, once you get it under the water, it's equally as hard to keep it under the water because it doesn't matter if you get tapped by a baby or if you, you know, your, your stomach goes the wrong way or so just the tiniest amount of infraction uh, and instability on the beach ball will do what? It'll send you over the side or over the front and that beach ball launches hitting whoever in, in the face who's in front of you always, all the time. But that's what makes it fun. I love sitting on the beach balls. When Paul says, when Paul says that all of humanity has this ability to know things about God, the question inevitably is, how can that possibly be true? Because I know people, and you know people, that would say that they don't know anything, or they need more evidence, or things, things of that nature, and, that's, and, I think, and I think that's okay. But what does the Apostle Paul say? He says the reason why people feel like they need more evidence is because what they do know, they do the beach ball effect. They take what they know and they submerge it as far as they can, and then they sit on it. Because they think if I take what I do know about God and I pretend like it's not there, then I don't have to deal with all of the other parts. And what Paul is saying is that, no, 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 you and I know, we know a lot. Creation itself tells us a lot. But the problem is not with creation. The problem is that we take what it tells us and we shove it down. We suppress it. We push it down. But here's the thing. And can I tell you this as someone who has sat on a beach ball for a long time, who took what I knew to be true about God and shoved it down as far as I can for, the, for a long time? Eventually, what happens it always resurfaces. It's usually during times of loss or hurt or pain. We're not able to sit on that truth anymore, and it starts to flow up. It starts to reemerge. It starts to resurface itself. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's hard. But immediately, sin tells us to take that truth and shove it back down. And ultimately, we're always doing this perpetually. That's why two scientists can look at the same information and have completely different conclusions. It's not that creation is not testifying to God's existence, to his truth, to his power. It's that we naturally are inclined to suppress that. Which means this, my friends. It means that as well as creation does of of preaching the wonders and power of God, it in itself is sufficient to tell us or to show us God's voice. We hear echoes of God's voice, but its clarity is not articulated in the way in which it is in another place in which we find God's voice, in the scriptures. The scriptures, the the creation is a playlist echoing God's voice, but the written word, the scriptures, are the most precise way of discerning and articulating God's voice and what he has spoken. If you look look at verse 7, you can see it, Right, you can see it right here as David begins to transition. He goes from talking about the creation to talking about the word. In David's case, he's talking specifically about the law. 
Because at his point in history, this is all that God has revealed. In our point in history, we have, a, we have a different perspective. We have a complete written form of what God intended to communicate to his people, which we call the Bible. But David is working with just what he has in the moment, which is the Torah, just the law. And so here's the thing about the Bible. How do we talk about the Bible? So I'm going to give you just a kind of like a rambling definition, and then I want to play with it a little bit, okay? So here, here how do, what, what, is, what is the Bible? The Bible is 66 books. So technically it's a library. It's not one particular book. It's 66 different books. 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books, written by chosen people from God, who the Spirit of God accompanied them in their writing without distorting their personality, using their personalities to scribe and to write messages that God has wanted to communicate to his people. And here's the, here's the, here's the part where people start getting, where it starts getting weird, but it's important to know that the Bible itself is without error, the Bible in itself, in its original autographs, and its original copies, is without error. And so therefore, it cannot, will not, ever not fail. It is without error. It will not fail. It is God's word written and inscribed, preserved for us, that we might hear and see God's voice. And no one in this room, everything I just said, no one in this room has doubted all that more than me. I mean, maybe, but I don't think so. I'm pretty sure in every room that I'm in, I take the cake on doubting the legitimacy of that rambling definition I just gave you about the Bible. So if you're there, if you're thinking, yeah, there's no way I can believe that. Like, you, it's, I, underst- I understand. I understand a thousand percent. I know a thousand percent is not a thing. I understand a hundred percent. I'm with you exactly. So here's what I want to do. There's a couple reasons why I think we should think of the Bible as I just described it. And really three ways in particular. And so you can call these arguments. You know, if you're an eight on the Enneagram, that probably excites you. Or you can call them, you know, you can, you can call them uh, just maybe three, maybe three purposes. Or maybe three, look, let's just look at it. The first reason why I think this definition of the Bible is really, really adequate is because, number one, this is what the Bible says about itself. Now listen, here's the thing about every, every good book. Good books tell you inside of them how to read them. Nonfiction, fiction. There's that old saying, if there's a knife in Act 1, you better be seeing that knife in someone's back by Act 3, right? The book is going to tell you how it wants to be read. Nonfiction, same way. If you look at, the, if you look at the, the table of contents in a nonfiction book, it better show a clear path of where that author is wanting to take you. The Bible is no different. If you look at verse 7 through 9, notice what David is saying about the Bible. He's saying that the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The rules of the Lord are true. What the Bible here is saying about itself is all of these different six characteristics. It is saying this is what it is. And this is not, Psalm 19 is not the only place where it does this. If we hop over to the New Testament, Paul does it all the time. So does Peter. Let's look at two real quick. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Probably the most, probably the most, the most obvious one that has to be dealt with is when Paul says all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. Or in 2 Peter 1, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy ever came to man. I'm paraphrasing my thing, went out, sorry. This is awkward. We run a roll here, sorry. It's never happened. 2 Peter 1 is incredibly, incredibly important. Because Peter's saying, hey, none of this is made up. No prophecy has ever been the product of, of the will of man, but, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. If you're going to believe, if you're going to consider how to think about the Bible, there is no higher category or person to, to reference other than Jesus himself, right? Is that fair? Like, we should have the same opinion of the Bible that Jesus has of the Bible. And what Jesus says in Matthew 5 is, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. Instead, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
For truly I say to you, that upon heaven and earth, none of it will pass away. Not an iota or a dot will pass away until all of the law is accomplished. The way you can think of an iota or, or, or a dot, an I, iota is the smallest little, fra- it's like, like, like if you have a Q, you know the little line that does like this? The little Q line that makes it different from an O. Are you with me? Okay. That's what Jesus is saying. Je- Jesus is saying that little Q line right there, everything that the Bible says will come to pass, including the Q line, all of it will come to pass because it is his word. None of it will be forsaken. None of it will, will go away. All of it will be accomplished. None of it will be forgotten. So Jesus has an incredibly high view of the scripture being actual scripture. But I know, I know some of you will say, well, okay, that's fine, and, that's fine and great. But you can't say the Bible is the Bible just because the Bible says it's the Bible. You see what I did there? You can't just say the Bible is the Bible because the Bible says the Bible is the Bible. Is that one more clear? But there is other ways in which we can, we can look at the Bible and say, hey, there's something really different about this. Here's the, here's the argument that got me. Here's the observation that got me. And it's really an argument for the formation and structure of the Bible. Like, do you understand this? When we think about the 66 different books in the Bible, all of them have been written over a 1,500-year period of time. 1,500-year period of time in three different languages, on three different continents, with 40 different authors represented from every single walk of life. You have rich people, you have very poor people, you have rural people, you have urban people, you have kings, you have warriors, all different types of people, male and female, writing and composing the Bible, yet, watch this, they tackle the most controversial issues known in humankind's history with amazing unity. Like that is amazing. That itself is a miracle. All of us could go in a room right now or just stay in this room and say, hey, what what do we let's talk about abortion. Let's talk about, let's talk about, you know, let's talk about God and race. Let's bring up all of these super controversial things. And I guarantee you, we may have to at some point agree to disagree. But the Bible attacks all of these different subjects and is unified over a 1,500-year span of time, three different languages, three different continents, which the most reasonable explanation for that is that there is a divine author that's guiding these writers. Otherwise, how do you get that? How in the world can you get that? The formation of the Bible in and of itself is miraculous. And the last thing I want to mention about the Bible is really this. That, yeah, the Bible can say it's the Bible. It has a miraculous formation, which at least has to get us to think about or pursue more about the Bible before we make a definitive judgment on it. But the last thing is this. The Bible is the only book in human history that bears the very, the very fingerprints of God. This is why David not only says the law of the Lord is perfect in verse 7, then, what, then notice what he says, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Precepts. Of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. See, there's, there's an effect to engaging with the Bible. It's not like reading Sherlock Holmes as great as Sherlock Holmes is. It's not like reading, reading Stephen King as great as Stephen King is. Like, it is, there is a reciprocal effect that occurs when you and I bury our heads in the scriptures. Different than any other book. Different than any other collection of books. And that's, this is why. Because the Bible itself is like a time port. It's like a hub where we actually go to read about and experience God's presence. Where we're, we're, we're in a sense transported before God himself as he is articulating very clearly reality, truth, us, redemption. The Bible is a place in which God's will, God's character is articulated very precisely. And that's why I think it was D.L. Moody, but recently I, I saw that no one really knows who said it. That's why this quote is so impactful and so true. The Bible really is the only book that will keep you from sin. The Bible will keep you from sin, but also the reverse is true. That's why sin will keep you from the Bible. The reverse is just, just as true. 
because it's in the scriptures and only in the scriptures are we given a very precise hearing of God's own voice. So lastly, here's, here's the deal. God speaks to us. His voice is echoed throughout creation. It's given us to us very precisely through the Bible. So what happens, what happens when we begin to actually hear God's voice? Like, how can you know? How can you know that you're hearing God's voice? Because there really are some telltale signs, and David's going to mention one of them here. Here's what David is going to say. David's going to say this, that God's voice, when we really hear God's voice and not our own voice or the voice of someone else, we, when we begin to hear God's voice, it begins to penetrate our souls at the deepest level possible. At the absolute deepest level possible. Look at verse 12. Because he begins to, tr- and notice, notice, notice the transition that he begins to make. He's been talking very much about creation, about the law, and then now watch, he begins to talk about what's going on inside of him. He says, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins and let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Like, do you notice the telltale sign that David is accessing God's voice is that David begins, his soul is being penetrated and he begins to confess sin. He begins to ask for forgiveness. He begins to see God as he is and he begins to ask God if he would accept him. He asks for forgiveness in private sins. He asks for forgiveness forgiveness in public sins. And what is so radically surprising to me as I was reading this throughout the week is how David phrases that last verse, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. I don't know why, but that word to me just was very uh, punchy. I thought, why would David say that? But see, here's, 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 here's what I think is happening, what's occurring. David is hearing the actual voice of God. And that voice is penetrating his soul. And he's being able to see himself as he really is. An imperfect sinner. Someone who has fallen greatly from God's standard. And he's looking at himself. And he's saying, oh my gosh, please accept me. I know who I am. I know the things that I've done. I know and I can see clearly who you are because you are the God who speaks. And you, I've seen your voice and your word and I do not add up. Please, please, please accept me. And the more I thought about it, the more I, th- I thought about this. I think what drives us to want to hear God's voice, if you go back with me when I was talking about my group of friends, when we were all talking and someone started sharing sins and then other people started, started asking for prayer and wanting to hear from God as well. I think what drives that is a deep sense that we can hear God's voice, that we want to ultimately because we desperately want to be accepted by him. I think they're connected. But here's what happens. We know who we are. We know the ways in which we failed. And the fear of not being accepted by him Instead of going to him, it makes us beach ball effect. Suppress the truth down. Don't deal with it. It's just easier not to deal with it. Hearing God's voice and wanting to be accepted by him are are, are absolutely connected. So the question is, how can anyone be accepted by God? How can God accept anyone? And David gives us the answer at the end of his prayer, when he acknowledges to God, God, you are my rock and you are my redeemer. So for David, those two things are very true. David, when he calls God the rock, is not thinking about Dwayne Johnson. He's not thinking about pebbles to throw in the lake. David is thinking about the mountainous region that is Israel and all of the clefts in which you would go inside if you're a shepherd and there's a big storm. You go squeeze in there, you know, Hopefully you were smaller, and you squeeze in there, and, you could, and, and, and you're protected from the storm. So he's looking at his life, the storm that's been created in his own life, and he's saying, God, you are my rock. You are the one in which I can hide in and be safe from all of the turmoil that occurs in life. And then he calls him his redeemer. 
God, you are the one that protects me from danger and harm. You're also the one that delivers me from danger and harm. And we say, yeah, that's, that's really great for David. <laughs> but can that truth be true for us? If God were to accept us, if we were to hear his voice, we would want him to accept us. Is it true? He, could he be our rock and redeemer the way in which he was for David? And the answer is 100,000% correct. He can. Because for God to accept a sinner, to embrace you and I with all of the mess that we bring, all of the brokenness that we, that we, that we bring, it would require God to look past those things, look past our shortcomings, our sins, and it would require him to voice, I see you as you are, and I accept you. And because and only because of Jesus, God can do that. It's only because of him. In Jesus, Jesus actually is the loudest voice that God has. He is the loudest expression, he's the loudest articulation of his own heart towards humanity, who is sinful, who's looking for acceptance, who he desperately will accept. Jesus himself, as the author of Hebrews says, that that in many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through prophets, but in the last days, he spoke to us through his son. Jesus is the final voice of God declaring to sinners, you are accepted, not based on your works, but based on what I am going to do for you and based on what I've done for you. Jesus himself stands in the place of sinners, sinners like me. He stands in our place and he is punished for our private and public sins. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, his voice is completely taken away from him that we might have access to the voice of God. Jesus himself is rejected so that we might be accepted. He's the hero of the story. He's the one that accomplishes for us what we can never do. And we can confidently say, God, you are my rock. You are my redeemer. Only when we know what Jesus has done for us on our behalf. So I think, where do we, where do we go from here? I think, I think this is a really important discussion. I think, it's, I think it's so important. Probably because personally I just have doubted, I've, I've struggled with the Bible itself for so many years. And I still have these questions that rise up or doubts that will creep in. And I think that's okay. Because in a real sense, it makes me really push what David said. Am I looking at creation as something that's glorifying God? Am I looking to the scriptures as a way in which, not that I can just read them, but also that they can read me? Is the scriptures keeping me from sin or is sin keeping me from the scriptures? In a real way, these are questions that I wouldn't ask myself if I didn't have doubts. Doubts are a good thing. They're a great thing. Can we find God's voice? Is it made available to us? Yes, it is. It plays throughout creation. It's precise in the scriptures. Jesus himself is the loudest version of God's voice who speaks to us very clearly on our behalf and advocates for us. And when you know you're hearing God's voice is when your soul is being penetrated. When you find yourself wanting to be accepted by him, that's a really good sign. When you find yourself confessing your own sin that you would be accepted by him, that's an even better sign. Those are the signs that say, I want to hear your voice, I do hear your voice, and I want to respond to it. The more that we get inside his word, and I know that's, that can be a daunting thing. People are like, where do I start? What do I do? What if I don't understand it? Here's my most wise advice. Just do it. Just get in it. Put a Bible in your bathroom. You're going to go in there at some point in the week. Just leave it in there. Start small, small little bites. Because the Bible has a reciprocal effect. Because you're entering and experiencing God's own presence in his written word. It's vastly and vitally important. Because God is a speaking God, he cares deeply about speaking with us. Trust him. Be thankful for him. And may our prayer be David's prayer. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you for speaking to us through your word and your creation and letting us know when we are hearing your voice. Father, we're thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. Lord, he was cut off that we might be brought in. He was not accepted that we might be accepted by you. Lord, would this be vitally important for us, for our community? Would we learn and behold wonderful things from your word? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.